On session, Michelle, will you please call the roll? Senator Searpoy. Present. Senator Fitzwater. Bean. Burnsketter. Brown. Here. Esslinger. Here. May. McCreary. Mosley. Thompson Raider. Trent. Quorum being present, we're now uh, in session. First bill we're going to hear this morning will be uh, Senate Bill 414. Senator Rodden, come forward, please. Proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Glad to be here today to present Senate Bill 414. Uh, this is a bill that was motivated by an issue that we had um, specifically in Cooper County, but other counties around the state last year where we had a an abandoned um, some propane tanks that uh, a company that uh, was charged with filling them effectively had gone um, missing. Nobody could get a hold of them and uh, during during some very cold days. So uh, this uh, bill seeks to rectify and kind of just put in place a kind of emergency scenario for making sure that these propane tanks get filled. Uh, currently, no other provider other than the owner of the petroleum gas tank can supply the gas tank. This bill would authorize parties to fill the, the uh, tank after a hearing before the uh, Missouri Propane Safety Commission. Uh, it specifies the, the uh, time frames for those hearings, etc. Uh, and then persons, companies that are granted authorization by the director will be immune, immune from civil liability uh, when it comes to supplying specific containers. So again, we're trying to make sure that a scenario where propane tanks need to be filled, a company like what we saw last year that basically the company just went out of business and never told anybody uh, and you couldn't get a hold of the owner. Nothing. You know, there was just a lot of uncertainty um, just trying to avoid a scenario like that. doesn't really change any of the underlying realities other than in the, these emergency scenarios. You have to go through a hearing and make sure that the ask uh, is is warranted so we have to answer any questions thank you so in the propane world do customers own the tanks in some cases or never do they own them uh -huh. in most in my understanding is in most cases they don't okay i'll wait for what yeah okay okay uh any questions for senator Adam? senator mccrary thank you for bringing this forward uh one of the and your we're looking at the, I'm looking at the sub right now, the sub ending in point zero two C. There's a new section that was added about the um, immune from any civil liability. Um, the, my only concern would be, you know, a scenario where a company that owns the tanks has kind of neglected maintenance of those tanks, but and then you've got a new provider coming in to fill those and if something would happen. So I'm just trying to think through how to protect yeah, I think the goal would be to protect the folks who are coming in, not the folks who are negligent, right? So if there's a if there's a provider that can fill the tank and and fill that void, because in the instance of the the company uh, in question uh, last winter, they um, they just couldn't be found. I mean, basically the company ceased ceased to exist without telling anybody. Uh, so the the idea is not to protect those folks. The idea is to pr protect the company or the folks that are are coming in and trying to fill the void, uh, right? Because they're they're, they're th this is a little bit of a gray area relative to what the law allows for, and so we're just trying to make sure that people who are trying to do the right thing and help folks make sure that they they have propane don't get punished for doing that. Yeah, I, I understand. I think um, maybe if I could just, uh, if there's a witness that can e explain to me a little bit about how the tanks are inspected. Yeah, so that then there will be people who know a lot more than I do. Awesome. Very good. Thank you. Any more questions? Senator Esslinger. Just very quickly. So the compensation for the person that's coming in behind the one that abandoned the tanks, are they compensated through the sale of the propane or how? how I, I would assume so. I would assume the compensation. I, I, we don't speak that directly here. I would assume it would just be the normal, okay. normal cost of doing business. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you. First, in support of uh, Senate Bill 4 and 4, please come forward. Anybody? Anybody in opposition to Senate Bill 4 and 4? Anybody for information purposes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Brent Hemphill. I'm here on behalf of the Missouri Propane Gas Association. We're testifying for informational purposes only because I think. Uh, Senator McCurry's question is extremely important in this discussion is to you I don't know if a this could just waive give the propane safety commission the ability to waive liability 
Um, and, and our concern is most people do rent the tanks. Um, some own their own tanks and they can have it purchased by whoever. They are inspected to make sure whoever fills that, that it's done in an appropriate and safe way and the meters and all the valves are working appropriately. This was a, a complete anomaly. I've never heard this. My boss, who has been at the Propane Gas Association for 30 years, has never heard of a propane company literally ceasing to exist. The owner um, was apparently having a health crisis. We never did find him. I haven't heard anything as it re relates to that. The employees were just told, don't show up. And then you had a cold spell come in where the um, tanks were running extremely low. Um, and it was my client, the association, that said, hey, we don't have uh, authority to go fill somebody else's tanks, but we do see the cold weather approaching, and it became a health crisis. And so we, we met with uh, Senator Radden. We appreciate him bringing this issue forward. He actually got on the phone with the governor's office to try to get some comfort to those companies who went in that emergency and ran in 50 gallons of fuel to get him through that crisis. He did issue a uh, proclamation that said essentially, you know, anybody that would go fill somebody else's tank would, you know, be exempt from some kind of immunity or would have immunity, but I just don't think that has a standing in court. So it, it was a wonderful gesture. It gave comfort to my members to go fill those tanks. Uh, but I don't know if we need to go pass a statute to allow others to fill other person's tanks or other companies' tanks and make that a regular course of business. So for that, we're testifying in for informational purposes only because we think it was just one of those freak instances that occurred. Companies just don't go out of business that frequently. Thank you. Questions for Brent? Uh, Senator Bean? I think this is right because we own our own tanks we rent tanks but going back to the safety side of it they will not fill a tank if it's not up to spec that is 100 percent I mean, correct they will not. gas companies like if we've got a valve that's bad until they replace that valve they will not fill it well tank. And particularly if you run a tank out of gas they will actually ask to go inside to ensure that you if you have like a pilot light that the thermal couple is still working and mm -hmm. you don't blow up the house due to some uh, activity of failure to inspect. So we, we do take our inspections very seriously and ensure, and you know, for the most part, propane tanks are very safe. I can tell you if you have a lighter in your fireplace, they won't fill your tank either. So Say that again? If you have a gas lighter in your fireplace, they won't fill your tank either, so. Really? No. You have to unhook it. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else uh, for information purposes? That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 414. Thank you, Senator Rodden. <clears throat> While everybody's here, let's uh, go into executive session. Uh, I make a motion we go into executive session. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? <clears throat> I move that we bring Senate Bill 374 before the committee. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Senate Bill 374 is before the committee. <clears throat> okay, Senate Bill 374 has got a substitute. Did everybody get that substitute? Yes. And as a reminder, 374 is what we heard last week. Uh, to, it's about renewable energy and large companies coming in and uh, their ability to purchase renewable energy to satisfy their own internal needs and some changes. So. Uh, if you look at the sub, it's gone from 10 megawatts to 100 megawatts. And uh, then there's uh, language in there also that says uh, this, it, it pretty much carves Ameren out. It's just for energy. And um, anybody have any questions or discussion? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right now, well, it will affect others as they come. I think there's another company looking to come into, into Evergy's territory that wants the same thing, wants to 100% renewable energy. Okay, and it's only dealing with renewable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, um, I move that we uh, adopt the Senate substitute for Senate, uh, Senate committee substitute for Senate Bill 374. Do I have a second? All those, all those, oppo all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We have adopted 
the uh, substitute. I, I now move that we do pass Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 374. Do I, somebody give me a second? Will you, uh, any more discussion? Michelle, will you please call the roll? Senator Searpoy. Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Bean? Aye. Burnsketter? <coughs> Brown? Aye. Esslinger? Aye. May? Aye. McCreary? Aye. Mosley? Thompson Raider? Aye. Trent? Curtis, I Okay. By your vote of 10 to 0, we have voted to do pass Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 374. I move we leave executive session. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? We're out of executive session. Uh, next up, uh, we will. Is Mary Elizabeth here? She's no, down here. Huh? Is she back? Okay. Uh, you can do. I'm going to do Mary Elizabeth. She's here. Okay. Well, let's do next, do Senate Bill 533, so the senator can go about her business. <laughs> senator Coleman, Mary Elizabeth, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Mary Elizabeth Coleman, State Senator for the 22nd District. And this bill is a tax bill disguised as a utility bill. What's happening is there is, um, since 2013, the state tax Commission has promulgated a form that talks about how you depreciate pipes and other um, other assets of the utility companies and how they're to be assessed so that they can be depreciated at a consistent level. There's a small minority of counties. Uh, the high water mark was, I think, five and the, uh, maybe two, depending on the different utility company, that is wanting to have a depreciation schedule that is different than the federal standard called the Makers 20. So what this bill is attempting to do is to codify what the status quo is and to take that state tax um, form and put it into statute so that these assets are able to be taxed consistently across the state and that they're depreciated over a 20 year period of time. Um, there's some discussion about, you know, we wanna make sure that when you have two public entities that are fighting, you're actually funding both sides of the fight and our constituents are funding both sides of that. So I think it's important that the legislature weighs in um, and that we have fairness and consistency throughout the, throughout the state. So if a Missourian's gonna receive water or gas service from a utility company, that person is gonna be paying a portion of the property taxes assessed on the utility's assets. Those are dollar for dollar pass through costs. So whatever we do, we're not increasing or decreasing the cost to the taxpayer other than stopping the litigation fight on both sides. So for most utilities, um, customers are gonna be grouped into one or two rate groups, meaning customers in different parts of the state are gonna pay the same rate for their utility service, which helps keep rates stable when investments are made in small communities. But it also means that if a county assessor in one county is gonna change that depreciation schedule used to determine the property tax rate for the utility, customers outside that county can end up picking up the tab for the tax rate, the hike, right? Resulting in a taxation without representation. So this bill is gonna ensure that all water and gas utility infrastructure is assessed and depreciated consistently and fairly throughout the state. Most assessors, almost all of them, like I said, the high water market, as this has been litigated was, in my understanding, five counties had done this differently. Um, so out of 163, that is a pretty small minority. Um, they're using the same depreciation schedule and it's just gonna put that practice into statute. Um, so it's the same everywhere. So I appreciate your consideration. This is a fairly technical area and when I was approached about handling this bill, I said, I don't know much about utilities. and um, but I don't think it's really matters that it's about utilities. I think what it matters is that taxpayers need to be treated fairly no matter who they are, and especially when that is a pass-through expense that's going to our constituents. So I think it's about fairness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to answer any questions, but there's gonna be a number of experts who can talk about the ongoing litigation as well as um, this, you know, the fight that has been happening. Sure. How many people wanna speak in favor of this bill? How many in opposition? <laughs> okay, uh, any questions for the Senator? Senator McCray? I recommend you. <laughs> Respectful of seniority. Uh, so what are the five counties? 
I'm so sorry. I, the, you know, you just open your mouth when you say those five. So my understanding is there's two currently for the for American Water that are doing this. One is Boone County, and then they just recently acquired another expansion. Um, of, and so that new county, I don't remember the name of, and it was five over the history of this issue. I don't believe it's currently five. I think there's three that Amron is dealing with right now. Um, but there are going to be experts who are actively involved in that litigation who can answer those questions. Okay. I'm assuming you saw what Boone County assessors said in the fiscal note. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting because you're talking about, you know, our constituents, customers being treated fairly, but Boone County, in, when they responded to the fiscal note, said this bill would give huge tax breaks for these companies while at the same time these companies are constantly before the PSC asking for rate increases. Once granted, these rate increases put an additional burden of taxpayers of Boone County in the state. Yeah, that's some spicy language. And I will say that I just fundamentally disagree that because of the way that we handle expenses that go to rate payers, that taxes are a pass-through expense dollar for dollar. And so I think that the assessor in Boone County fundamentally misunderstands how this is done. and. I just disagree with okay. that assessment well, of the I, assessor. I want to try, try to understand it. I, and I agree with you, this isn't really a utility issue as much as the tax ish, ta taxation issue. But whenever a county says it's going to have an impact of two over $2 million, it catches my eye. Yeah, and part of it, too, is right. So just kind of going back to it, we have personal property taxes taxed at about 33 and a third percent, mm -hmm. and property taxes assessed at about 32 percent. So switching it would actually be a little bit of an increase maybe, but then there's an offset because there's a fee that is tacked on for one of the funds that the fiscal note is going to talk about. And so it's got, there's going to be a, a little bit of a variation. Some counties might see a little bit of an increase. Some counties might see a little bit of a decrease. But I'd remind you that from a rate standing perspective, those that type of expense passes directly through to the rate payer. And then we're also, um, when the rates are set, they're clumped together by different regions. So it could be that one county is assessed differently, but the surrounding counties are using a different depreciation schedule. So those surrounding counties are actually going to be offsetting the expense. They're going to be paying more expense because that's a pass-through expense for the rate for that entire region. And so that doesn't feel fair to me, that because one assessor is handling it differently than the other assessors, this, these other surrounding counties are going to be paying more for the expense of the one assessor's different depreciation schedule. I would also say one of the assessors talks about a 50-year depreciation schedule, and that's not found anywhere in statute or any of the tax forms. It's just made up. And so that 50-year depreciation level is not a consistent depreciation in federal or state tax code. So I just, I just disagree with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator Esslinger? <laughs> just curious, Senator. Uh, it looks to me like this bill has has uh, been passed around for about two or three years. I think this is actually the fourth year. Fourth year. Can you tell me what's different about this and why this would be successful this year or, or why it has not had found success? Yeah, so you're in a situation where um, the only real loser by us not addressing anything, I think, is the taxpayer because we're funding both sides of the litigation. And so sometimes what happens is this has been since 2013, that tax form has been promulgated and there's been... I would call them rogue assessors since that point who've been doing it at a different level. Um, it's important that we find consistency and when when one side seemed, it, it, I think that there was a breakdown in negotiations in the past and um, there's one party that wasn't at the table um, and so the sponsors decided not to continue to move things forward. I don't think that that's where the parties are right now. Um, and I've used some strong language about the, a couple of the assessors, but I've had good productive meetings with the Assessors Association, and they seem like willing partners to try to see if there's some kind of resolution that can take place. And so I feel really hopeful. The, most, um, can, the, the last piece of litigation that's going on right now, there was um, uh, something that was remitted back to the tax, uh, not tax court, I'm blanking on the phrase, but anyways, it, it just got sent back. And that was argued in June. We still don't have a result. I think sometimes they wait to release things until after session is over, but that's my best guess. So I, I think you have one party who's fine with the status quo, and that's those few assessors. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator May. 
Yeah. Good morning. Good Senator. morning, Senator. So I just want to, you know, I know the technical questions, but so let me ask this question. So what we're doing here is we're talking about what can be assessed as basically personal property. Yes, sir. And so the storage well, of the storage facilities that they're using are now being taxed as personal property, and we're saying we don't want those taxed as personal property. Is that basically the gist of it? So there's two separate fights, I would say. One is what should we classify this asset type as? Should it be classified as personal property or should it be classified as real property? The law school, so if you were in property class, your first year of law school, the first thing that you learn is that assets that are permanently attached to real property become an extension of real property. And so there are you know, all kinds of lien laws about how that then becomes treated under, the, under our, our taxation statutes. If something is just put there, then it's tangible person property because you can move it and it doesn't become part of the real property. Mm -hmm. This is a tricky type of asset and the reason why is because it's not on somebody else's property, it's in an easement. And so somebody is renting the rights to be able to, in fact we are, the taxpayers, we're renting the rights for these entities or the entities are doing it and then passing the cost along to taxpayers to have this property there and then it's permanently affixed. So is it, it it's just, that's the first fight. Is it tangible or is it real property? And then the second fight is how should it depreci be depreciated if once we pick the kind of asset that it is? Real property under the promulgated form since 2013 of this category has been depreciated under the Maker's 20 rule, so over a 20 year period of time. Some assessors are going out as far as 50 years. I, they're going to tell you what they think about this. My, my takeaway and um, you know, I don't know whether the industries are going to agree with this or not, but my takeaway is that people care less about the way that it is defined as real or tangible personal property. They care, but that's not what they care most about. What they care about is what is that depreciation schedule, because that's where the main costs are being passed through to the taxpayer. Okay, and so we're and, saying... And the revenue for the counties, right? Because the counties, if they're depreciating absolutely. it longer, then there's going to be more upfront money coming in. Okay, and so basically the, the assessment is, so the tax assessment that's happening on this property, their revenue is going to the local uh, municipalities, but you're saying at the same time it's being passed to the consumers. So are we saying that? Yeah, the expense of that is being passed to the consumers because it's a dollar for dollar for the rate. When they set the rates at the PSC, the, the utilities are, go to the PSC, and I'm sorry if I butcher this, you guys will have to correct me, but my understanding is that the, they go directly to the PSC, they say here are our expenses, and they look at that as a direct pass-through cost when they're setting the rate for the taxpayer. Um, and this is one of those types of assets. So it, it, in my opinion, we're funding both sides of the fight. Yeah, my challenge in this is, you know, um, saying, you know, when we're talking about local municipalities and taxation, we're saying that, well, no company should have taxes. That's Basically, not, yeah, that's, I know, yeah, I know, that's what I'm but, saying here. I know, but I'm saying, you know, when we're looking at it, because all companies pass expenses on to consumers through some form or another. Sure, yeah. So it's just like, how do we manage that? And that's what the Public Service Commission is supposed to do, minimize the impact to consumers. Well, and I would say what my goal is, is to make sure that people across the state are, are treated fairly by having every political subdivision treat this same kind of asset in the same way. Okay. And so that's what your bill does. That's what my bill does. Leveling the playing field. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? The first person is speaking in favor, please come forward. Make sure you fill out a, a um, witness form. Give us your name and then give us your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take this and submit it when I'm, when I'm finished. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Matt Landwehr and I'm testifying in support of Senate Bill 533. I'm an attorney at the Thompson Coburn Law Firm in St. Louis and I've litigated the problem that Senate Bill 533 seeks to correct before the State Tax Commission and the Missouri Courts. Senate Bill 533 creates uniformity consistency and predictability in how rate regulated natural gas and water utilities are assessed property tax. And what it does is it changes the classification of these pipes and what 
just to be clarified, the assets we're talking about are service mains and uh, service pipes and mains. And it, it changes the classification of those pipes um, from real property to personal property. This change in classification will require county assessors to assess these pipes using the statutory depreciation formula um, for business personal property that's already in the statute in section 137.122. It's also referred to as Makers 20 depreciation. Now, I want to be clarified, this is not a drastic change. Um, as the Senator mentioned, the Missouri State Tax Commission has recommended this type of depreciation, regardless of whether you're classifying the property as real or personal. The State Tax Commission says, doesn't matter, depreciate it using this statutory depreciation formula. And they've had that in place since 2013. All three Missouri Courts of Appeal have weighed in on this issue um, and have each said that the State Tax Commission's recommended depreciation schedule is logically grounded because these assets, which are currently classified as real property, share the same characteristics as personal property. So you should depreciate them the same way. Another important point to take away is this isn't something that is going to be unique in Missouri. As a matter of fact, this, would, this legislation would bring Missouri into the majority of states that how they classify this type of property. Um, I litigate property tax cases for a living. Um, I know what other states do. Um, Illinois, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Michigan, Florida, Colorado, Minnesota, Montana, Ohio, Utah, to name a few, all classify these types of pipes as personal property. And in fact, in Missouri, the case law had classified them as personal property up until 1991 when the General Assembly amended the definition of real property to include these pipes as real property. I, I wasn't around at that time. I have no idea why they did that, but they did that. And so what we're seeking to do is to bring Missouri back into the norm. And, and basically, if you look at the bill, you'll see the language just takes that phrase that was added in 1991 and moves it to the, to the real property definition. So Senate Bill 533 kind of brings us back to the norm. But most importantly, the vast majority of county assessors, and when I say vast majority, 90 percent, maybe more, and I can talk about, I know there's some questions about which counties, we can, we can, I can certainly answer questions about that. The vast majority of the county assessors have followed the state tax commission's uh, form since 2013 and have depreciated the property in the way that this legislation would make uniform across the state. So then the question is, why make this change? Well, as the senator alluded to, a few rogue county assessors have ignored the state tax commission's form and have decided to depreciate the property in their own way, and they vary from county to county. But they're uniformly raising the assessments. Sometimes in the, in the county that I'm litigating in now, triple the value of what the form would dictate should be. And what, has, what this has done is led to wildly excessive property tax assessments against utilities in those few counties, which in turn leads to expensive litigation, expensive appraisers, and they're ongoing. These same cases have been litigated since 2013, and they're still ongoing, so 10 years now. Um, this impacts all the ratepayers across the state, not just the ones in those counties. So why is that? Rate-regulated rate -regulated utilities are recover their costs, um, including property tax expense, through rate increases authorized by the Public Service Commission. And rate increases are not county specific. So you might think, well, why not just raise the rate in the particular county that's, that's charging the tax? It doesn't work that way. The rate applies to a group of counties, sometimes half the state. And so what happens is a handful of counties in that rate group will get triple the value in tax revenue, but the taxpayers in all the other counties are picking up that tab. And that's just not fair. Taxation without representation is unfair and needs to be corrected. The proposed change would resolve any question as to the appropriate valuation methodology and the amount of depreciation to be applied to these pipes and would apply the same in every county, which was what the State Tax Commission form was designed to do, but the State Tax Commission didn't have the authority to mandate that. It had only had the authority to recommend the depreciation. This will create uniform assessment of property across the state and prevent windfalls in favor of a few counties at the expense of the ratepayers in the other counties. This will also create consistency and predictability for counties and utilities. It'll also work me out of a job, right? Because there'd be no need to litigate these cases. There will be no need to have expensive appraisers and appraisals because the statutory depreciation formula set forth in section 137, 122 is easy to apply. You, you put the numbers into a spreadsheet, you apply the depreciation schedule, it spits out a number and everybody moves on. 
you don't need to have an expensive appraiser, an expensive lawyer to come in and litigate and fight over these issues. Uh, the county assessors know very well how to uh, do this. As I mentioned, you guys probably have all seen the personal property tax forms that you get. It's a form that the taxpayer fills out. They fill in numbers. The assessors know how to apply the depreciation formula, so it doesn't require extra manpower, no extra burden on the assessor's office to apply this uh, methodology. As I mentioned, the vast majority of the counties are already doing it just fine. Um, it's good tax policy to create uniformity and consistency and predictability, and that's what Senate Bill 533 does. Now, I, if I could, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to reference some testimony. So there's a companion bill in the House um, that has already had its hearing a month or so ago, and a former state tax, tax commissioner, Mr. Randy Holman, submitted testimony in that, in that um, before that body, written testimony, and he was unable to be here today. Um, I, I realize the, the committee does not want to accept written testimony. Um, if, it, if Mr. Chairman likes, I could just kind of summarize for the committee what Mr. Holman had to say, um, or I also have copies of that written testimony as well. Yeah, I'll hand those out. If, if I could just take a minute to briefly sure, summarize why I think that the committee should pay particular attention to that testimony. Um, Mr. Holman, as I mentioned, was a commissioner at the Missouri State Tax Commission from 2010 through 2016. Prior to that, Mr. Holman was the elected county assessor for Jefferson County um, for 16 years up until that point, um, in which he was heavily involved in, in various roles with the Missouri State Tax Assessors Association. And what's unique about Mr. Holman is he's one of the very few former assessors to become a commissioner at the State Tax Commission. And so he brings from him an assessor's point of view, brought with him an assessor's point of view to the State Tax Commission. And uh, he's also a licensed real estate appraiser and has over 30 years of experience in taxation, pro the assessment of property tax. And Mr. Holman supports Senate Bill, or well, I should say House Bill 349, which is the same bill here. And he explains in the written testimony the reasons for that, and they, they mirror some of the reasons that I've been saying here. I, I won't repeat all of those, but I, would, I will submit uh, copies of, of that written testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your so time. So this, this, uh, this way of doing this, what is the depreciation schedule that goes with that? How long? Uh, it's the, the maker's depreciation schedule. So the way the current statute, 137-122, for business personal property works is within the statute there are different <laughs> depreciation schedules based on the class life of the type of asset. They range anywhere from five years for fastly depreciating property all the way up to 20 years. And the pipes are the types of assets that fall under the 20-year okay. depreciation schedule, so 20-year okay. schedule. But the difference is there is no, there's no floor. I, I should say that. I misstate that. There is no, some assets you would depreciate down to zero. Right. Um, the way the statute works, assets that are business first property never depreciate to right. zero. They right. maintain a 20% floor through the, through the life of, okay. of the pipe. And for a county to lose $2 million, how are they doing that? Is that, um, that doesn't, that's a big number for what this seems to be doing. So, so I, as, as the <coughs> Senator mentioned, um, I disagree with that with that testimony, and I will mention, uh, I think Senator McCurry asked which counties are fighting. Boone County is one of those counties, and probably perhaps the most aggressively one that's fighting this. Um, I think that fiscal note is, is a misstatement of the impact. Um, the, the big takeaway that I took from that is a misunderstanding of how this applies and who's paying this tax. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, ta the utilities have to write the check, but as this, sure. The committee is aware um, you, those are passed through right to the ratepayers. Plus, so we passed a tracker last year so they can track them. Exactly. The tracker so. is, a, is a big factor in all this because mm -hmm. the, there's a true up every time there's a rate mm -hmm. case, and so the utilities don't stand to benefit from this. Right. Where, where, where the utilities, the, the benefit to the utilities and the assessors alike is uniformity. It, be, it, it ta takes an issue and makes it a no-brainer, right? There's a one simple formula you, f you follow, which has been applied to personal property, business personal property for the past 15 years, well, I say 15 years, without any real litigation. Like, as I mentioned, I litigate these cases. You go through the State Tax Commission decisions prior to 2005, you would find personal property cases and decisions up and down, you'd find hundreds of them. Okay. Now you can count them on your hand. There just is not a lot of litigation over business personal property, and that's what this body did in 2005 when they passed that law. So you know, I think I also heard you say that, that these counties are reassessing this property? 
what is what what goes into that? I don't understand. I understand real estate goes up in price. How do they reassess a pipe or a, a, a right away? Yeah, so that's a good question. So so real property by the Missouri Constitution is reassessed every two years. Um, this is not, and you know, we talk about, is this really more like real property? Is it more like personal property? Well, it's more like personal property because what are we talking about? We're talking about a piece of pipe that has fluid or gas running through it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It wears out. It corrodes. The, the utilities are, are frequently pulling them up. They're replacing them. There's a lot of capital improvement projects going on throughout the state. Um, contrast that with what we all think of as real property, your house. Your like, house doesn't depreciate. It goes up and down. Is a reassessment occurring then when they replace the pipe? Is that what? what well, so when they would replace the pipe, the way it would work under this under this statute is the original. So the, the statute is based on original cost. So the utility is required to report to the county how much it paid for that pipe and the year that it placed it in service. So you take a 20-year-old pipe and let's say $10,000 paid for the pipe. That number goes on the form, and then based on the schedule, there's a certain a reduction, a percentage reduction over the years that reduces that value. Right. So that's the pipe that's 20 years old. If that pipe is replaced in 2023, that old $10,000 pipe goes away. It's called a retirement. It's no longer there. The new pipe that might cost $50,000 today goes in, and that pipe's depreciation starts day one sure. now. And so that pipe is going to get depreciation, and maybe in 20 years that value gets reduced. But that makes sense, right? It's going to be a 20-year-old pipe. So when does the reassessment? Are they reassessing existing lines that haven't been touched? No, I, they shouldn't. I mean, I, I agree. That's what I'm Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't understand. They're, they're, not, re, they're not reassessing... Um, pipes that are just there that have okay. been there. Those have been assessed for years okay. and years and years. Okay. I, mis um, I may have misunderstood the way it was said. Any other questions for this witness? Uh, Senator May. So basically, you're saying the various counties are doing the schedule differently. And so one county can be charging a higher tax than another county. So with this legislation, even if we pass this legislation, what's going to make them comply if it has no teeth? So, so the difference is, and that's a great question. So, I've, so in the assess, State Tax Commission Assessor's Manual, which I have a copy of here, um, there is a form that mm -hmm. is to be filled out. And what this form says is this is the depreciation that the State Tax Commission recommends. Mm -hmm. The State Tax Commission is not mandating that the counties do this. They're saying this is what we recommend as the administrative agency that is charged with the obligation of kind of equalizing property values across the state. 90%, mm -hmm. the vast majority, follow that form. It's a voluntary compliance. They mm -hmm. could say no. A handful of them are saying no. And what they're doing is they're taking that form and they're ripping it up and throwing it away. Mm -hmm. They're saying, forget about that form. We're going to apply a completely different methodology. We're going to do replacement cost new, less depreciation. We're going to do a unit value. There's all different, many different ways to value property. Mm -hmm. The state tax commission can decide which one it's going to recommend. The same approach doesn't apply to all types of property. I mean, for your house, you would use a sales comparison approach. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't use an income approach. You know, so there's right. different types of methodologies. And the way the Public Service Commission sets rates, it uses an original cost less depreciation methodology. The form adopts a similar methodology. Mm -hmm. um, and so the counties that are not complying are not even attempting to do that type of methodology. They're doing something completely different. And as I mentioned, the case that I'm litigating now, um, they on appeal, they, they brought an expert appraiser to triple the value of even the assessor's own assessment. So the assessor issued assessment goes up on appeal. This, is, this assessor hired an appraiser to come in who came up with a different methodology altogether that tripled the value of the property. It's, it's a problem for these handful of counties. And, you, and your, I think your question was, what is going to mandate that they comply? If, the, if you, as, right. as the governing body says in law, this is what you need to do, that's what they have to do. You hoping. I'm Thank hoping. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Next, uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Make sure you leave that form or fill it out and leave it. I will. Thank you. Next, in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Ray McCarty, President of Associated Industries of Missouri. And uh, I just wanted to say one thing. Senator McCreary mentioned the fiscal note and the response from Boone County, and you mentioned it as well, Senator May and Mr. Chairman. 
Um, that's, this is an unusual situation. Normally in a fiscal note, oversight will send out fiscal note responses out to the counties and various political subdivisions and all the state agencies and ask them to get back to them, tell them what something's going to cost. I would ask you to bear in mind when you're reading that that obviously they're on the other side of this issue. So it's not very often that you can lobby through a fiscal note, but in this case they kind of can. Uh, we support the fact that all of these costs are paid by the customers. And as we've talked about other bills, this is the same way. This flows through to customers. Um, most of the state, 113 out of the 114 plus the city of St. Louis or so, are following the same schedule. And what you would be doing is making sure nothing changes for them, but the others actually have to follow the same methodology. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thanks, Ray. Anybody have a question? Any senators have questions? Seeing none, thanks, Thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Philip Arnzen with the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, we have a longstanding policy of supporting consistent and, <clears throat> excuse me, predictable tax policy to make sure that um, it's easy to do business across the state and you don't have to increase your administrative or legal costs um, doing business in different jurisdictions. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next, in favor, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Christine Page, representing Missouri American Water. Um, the previous testimony has been very comprehensive, so I'm going to be very brief. I um, just wanted to reiterate um, regarding that fiscal note and the comment from Boone County. Um, it says that there will be a huge tax break for these companies. Um, and I wanted to just reiterate the fact that this is a dollar for dollar pass through to our customers. I feel like that statement is implying that the company will in some way profit or benefit, and that is not the case, especially with the property tax tracker that was passed last, ses last session by this body. Um, and then it says, while at the same time they are constantly before the PSC asking for rate increases. Um, the increase in our customer rates are driven by our investment, the replacement of this aging pipe. And so when we replace a pipe that is 70 to 100 years old, um, our customers actually end up paying higher property taxes that go with that. So the property taxes that our customers are paying are going up every single year due to our investment in our, in our state and in our infrastructure. So I just wanted to clarify those points and also the fact that you know, in, in all of the counties that we operate in and that the other utilities uh, operate in, that um, you only heard from a handful of those counties that are fighting this in court in that fiscal note. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So does American Water, they have mo mostly local networks of pipes. So are you, are you centrally assessed on, that, that, on anything? That's a great question. So unlike, um, you know, a, an electric grid or even a pipeline system that's interconnected, our systems are not physically connected, right? So our Jefferson City mm -hmm. system is not connected in any way to our Joplin system. However, for rate making purposes, the Public Service Commission has grouped our customers historically into large rate, rate groups. And that ensures that when we invest in a particular community, that that rate impact of that investment is not just borne by that local community, it's spread out so that you have more gradual rate increases over time time as opposed to like a, a more lumpy distribution um, of those rates. And so um, if you are a um, customer of ours in Jefferson City, for example, if, if you pay your water bill here, you are grouped in with customers from 29 other counties in the communities that we serve. And so, for example, we have a particular county in that group that is assessing um, our distribution assets over a longer time period, 37 and a half years instead of 20 years. And so that cost is being, then being spread to our customers in Jefferson City, even though it's not Cole County that's doing that. Well, thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Larry Ployce with Spire Missouri Natural Gas. Real briefly here, just to, to follow up on the previous testimony, um, we serve about 1.2 million customers in this state. We replace about $200 million worth of pipe a year in our capital improvements. Um, you tag that along with connecting new customers. In the, it would be an anomaly if the counties that we serve would receive some type of tax reduction. This is doing nothing but increasing those tax revenues. So it, it would really be an anomaly. I've been involved in this conversation probably since the beginning. And the initial intent with the counties and working with them is to not create sticker shock, was to not cause either the companies and their customers 
or the counties some significant change in taxpayer revenue. I would also I would also add to um, the conversation that in the counties where there is a fiscal note, um, I would say that you probably could track back to the beginning of 2013. The starting point is probably where that reduction occurred when they start applying this this form. But I'll let them talk to that perspective. But I would say to some extent, maybe some of this occurred back in 2013 when they started applying this. Most of the counties started applying this. I think we are down, we serve approximately four upper 40s in counties. I think we have three counties left that we're still litigating. And we would really appreciate the ability to stop the litigation cost, stop the payments under protest, and find a solution to this. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, David Wynn here on behalf of Liberty Utilities and Summit Utilities. I want to go on record and support the legislation. I don't have anything else to add to my colleagues. Questions for Mr. Witten? Seeing none, Thank you, remember Chair. to leave a witness form if you would. Thank you. Next in favor. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Zach Pollock, registered lobbyist for the Missouri Natural Gas Association, just want to go on record in support of the bill. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none. Thank, Thank you. you. Members of the committee, Zach Monroe on behalf of Amherst, Missouri, here to testify in support of the bill. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none. Next in favor? Would. Uh, the uh, opposition, please come forward. I was going to switch back and forth, but since there's only you, I thought, what the heck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Trent Watson, registered lobbyist here on behalf of the um, Missouri Association of Counties here in opposition to the bill. Um, everyone who has testified so far has said they want a uniform methodology for how their systems are assessed. We agree. Association of Counties and the Assessors Association, we want the exact same thing. Um, we, op we oppose their bill because it changes two uniform definitions to the assessment and appraisal process. The definition of real property has always been throughout the nation something that cannot be easily removed from the property without causing damage. It is affixed to the property. Treating these pipes as personal property goes, flies in the face of that definition. Uh, we are wholeheartedly in support of putting this on a 20-year Mackers. Uh, last, year, last session we worked with the Senate sponsor about keeping this as real property, putting it on the 20-year Mackers. We had a request from the Assessors Association where we needed to know miles of pipe, the diameter of pipe, what it's made of, the age of it, and where it is. Now, why would the assessor need to know that? Because the assessor's job is to apply value to something. He needs to see it and say, this is the value that is applied to that. Then the collector applies that to the proper taxing jurisdiction. So in order to do that, you need to know what it is, you need to know what it's made of, how much of it there is, how old it is, and where it is, so you can put it in the proper um, taxing jurisdiction so that that money is they said they're, they are assessed locally, so that money needs to go into that proper taxing jurisdiction. So that's kind of where we left it last year, and, and discussions seem to break down. We're, con we're happy to continue discussing it. I think there is a path forward on this. Um, I think there is some confusion um, on the form that keeps getting referenced that the State Tax Commission has. It was never something that the State Tax Commission took a vote on and sent out to the assessors and said, use this. It was put in the appraisal manual as a suggestion, um, but that type of statement from the tax commission would have probably cleared up a lot of this years ago. Um, but I do think there is a, a path forward to find a way that everyone, all these companies that have testified behind me would know exactly how they're gonna be traded and no matter what county they're in in this state. And I'm happy to keep working forward and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Trent. Questions for this Senator May. So basically, you're assessing the pipes, but you don't know where they are, if they exist? In many of these cases, the company will say, we have $8 million worth of assets in your county, and here's the depreciation scale. Hmm. And so we don't know what those assets are, where they are. Where they're located, correct. 
Mm -hmm. I do believe, and I don't want to speak for him, but I believe Missouri American Water provides a little bit more detail to St. Louis County where they're um, located. And they, they, I believe from the information they gave me was, they provide that information to the county under, um, basically under sworn affidavit that this is where this information is or what the, what the taxing calculations are. Okay, very good. Sorry, Senator McCrary. Uh, would you happen to be able to share the counties, the five counties that were mentioned by the sponsor? Well, they, they mentioned the five counties, but I think those are the five counties that Missouri American operates in. Okay. I can't say, um, like an example, my past president of the Assessors Association is in Howe County. Well, Missouri American and Spire don't operate in his county. He has a different gas company. So having that information, if we're talking about getting a uniform system across the board, this would solve the problems that they're having in those other counties as well that are not basically brought to light by Missouri American or Spire. So just to clarify then, the impact of this bill is more than just a handful of counties. If we're going to solve the problem, let's solve the problem, right? Okay, thank you. I'm curious because these taxes go to school districts, fire districts, the same thing all of our property yes. taxes go. So if you don't know where a pipe is, how do you know what school district to give it to? That's a great question. Well, I'm saying they, 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 they must know where it is. Well, that information isn't readily given. Okay. So some counties work better with their companies, some don't. I think that's why you see the lawsuits. I mean, the, the goal, if, if you, the goal ought to be that we have a system that's pretty much unchallengeable, right? Here's the information, you've sent it in under a sworn affidavit or whatever moving method we want to move forward. And that's what it is, and, and it gets put in the file. The assessment process moves forward. Okay, thank you, Senator May. So, do the pipes or the do they expand beyond one county to another county? I would assume in many cases they do, but Senator, I don't I don't have full knowledge of that. I can't answer that. Okay, is there a company here that can answer that question? Hmm. No takers. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for this witness? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Trent. Thank Anybody you. In, for information purposes? <laughs> Please state your name and give us your testimony. Thank you, members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Arne C. A.C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate. In the definition of um, for tax assessment, assessment purposes is this is stationary and not mobile or movable um, assets like a trailer a mobile home a car those that's personal property but under the definition of our tax assessment this is stationary and is not mobile so that's the first issue this is special interest legislation written all over it this is targeted legislation we heard from all the lobbyists that are all for it and you know why? Because their companies have huge uh, profits and they get paid to uh, try to sway you one way while Missouri consumers uh, pay their cost and pay their um, shareholders' profits. Uh, these companies seem to pay their fair share to Missouri, to school districts, to fire protection dis districts. They need and, and um, require uh, special district or special services. Um, this smells like special interest, uh, in my opinion. It's unfair to other pipelines and fuel um, industries that make huge profits, as I've stated. This is an un unfair tax break. I urge the committee to defeat this bill. Um, all costs will be raised to the consumer uh, in bill payments. And we already have in um, state statute a great appeal process. If somebody is unhappy with their tax assessment, you appeal to the county board of equalization, which is three citizens. If you're unhappy of that decision, you appeal to the Missouri State Tax Commission, which is three citizens that are appointed by the governor with the confirmation of the state senate. And if you're unhappy with the state tax commission, you can appeal to state county circuit court and go through the court process. This bill reeks of unfairness to Missouri consumers. And I ask each one of the senators on the committee, don't forget your 
um, Missourians back in your home districts. That's my testimony, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody? Um, David, did you want to speak for information purposes? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm David Wood. I'm a policy analyst and liaison for the State Tax Commission. Uh, just to clear up a couple of questions that's come up during the testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you'd ask about central assessment as to whether it's local or central. Uh, when it's the main transmission lines for gas that cross state lines, those are centrally assessed. But on the local distribution of homes, that is locally assessed. So that would go county by county as to whether they would have to know what those lines are. Uh, there is not a detailed reporting that goes to the assessors as to the, the lines, uh, similar to what the PSC would get in their rates. Um, but the tax, each individual assessor is responsible for knowing what lines are there and how they fit into um, the taxing situation. Uh, the reason that the Tax Commission hasn't come out with an official document on this is partly because of the litigation that's in place. So as the previous witness just said, when you have an appeal on your taxes uh, or your assessment, it actually goes to the BOE, then to the State Tax Commission to make a determination on that assessment. So if they put out a form with a specific way to do this while there's litigation going in place, that would kind of be a a tilt on how that litigation may go, where statute doesn't necessarily do that. So as long as there's cases in court, the tax commission wouldn't want to <coughs> prejudice their decisions one way or another on that appeal. In terms of the process, uh, we are not taking a position one way or the other on the bill. But if you need information or have questions, I'd be glad to try and answer those. Senator May. So you said two things. Pipes that cross more than one county are centrally assessed. They are locally assessed if it's going to the homes. Okay. So the only lines that are centrally assessed is with the utilities that bring them into the state of Missouri, those main transmission lines. Okay. But if it's the distribution lines to the homes, right now they're locally assessed. So they're locally assessed. So who, is, who does the central assessment? Uh, the state tax commission. We have, that's just like doing power lines and utilities. Okay, very good. See so, you know, Thank you, David. <clears throat> that will conclude the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 481. Next, we will hear Senate Bill. I'm sorry. 533. I apologize. <clears throat> Next, we'll hear uh, Senate Bill 481. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Senator. Thompson Rader from Southeast Missouri. And I have a bill. I appreciate you hearing this bill. And um, I'm going to give a, a brief overview. It's, it's technical. It won't, it's not like long technical to explain, but it, I will need my commissioner back here that has um, worked on this for many years. So back in 2019, this is a bill that Senator Romine passed out of, of the Senate and House, got to the governor's desk, passed out overwhelmingly in the House and Senate. Um, the governor had some technical issues because it, it deals with the federal, some of the federal departments, and so he vetoed it. The bill that you have before you is what we have worked on and went through the governor's office as well to make sure we were addressing all of the veto portions. So what this bill does is, is the feds had, had detailed many moons ago um, that the mining, because th that mining royalties would be dispersed and it was kind of stuck under a section that was talking about forestry, the forest lands. 
And so the way that we started doing it here in the state is we just started dispersing our mining royalties based on our forest land. Well, you have a lot of counties with forest land, very few that are doing the mining. And so like Iron and Reynolds County, for example, for many years have been paying the expense of having the mines and the, the roads being torn up, the lead being in their yards and everything else, but they have not had the financial backing that these royalties are supposed to be helpful with. And so what Senator Romine had done and, and what this bill does is it changes that to where it gives the lion's share of the portion of the royalties to the counties that are actually doing the mining. And, um, and, I, and I do have, what, what you have is a um, substitute, a committee substitute, and that was just a technical fix that was done in the House. And so we did that as well on the Senate side. The House bill was heard last week, had great response. It was voted out um, yesterday out of the uh, House committee. And so um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, we can bring up Commissioner Skaggs and, and let him be a little more eloquent on the explanation. Any questions <laughs> for the Senator? Seeing none. Uh, the Commissioner Skaggs, you like to come up first and testify? Good morning. Please uh, leave your witness form and, Chairman, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this hearing. Uh, my name is Jim Skaggs. I'm the presiding commissioner of Iron County and uh, actually live uh, just a short distance from the mining operation. Uh, this has been somewhat of a technical issue for many years. Uh, I've been working on this since 2018 uh, when I discovered it discovered the issue when I was presiding commissioner. Uh, so what happens, you have two different federal programs uh, that dictate federal land in our county. One of them is the top of the surface, which is the forest products, which is governed by the USDA, US Forest Service. The underground mining, which is all done underground, is the leasehold on that is BLM, Bureau of Land Management which is governed by the Department of Interior. So there's actually two revenue streams that come from federal land in our county. One is the forest products, one is the undermined uh, lead mining. So what happens, the mining company pays a royalty to the federal government. The federal government keeps 75% of that mining royalty. They give 25% back to the state of Missouri. The state of Missouri, because there was no statute divided that money among all the counties that have a national force in them. So we have 27 counties in the state that gets the mine royalties from the mining activity that occurs in Iron and Reynolds County. Some counties get more money than Iron and Reynolds County gets. So all the lead in the United States, 98% of that is produced right here in Iron and Reynolds County. So when you get, to get up in the morning and start your car, more than likely it come from Iron County. However, we get very little revenue from that. So if this was private land, if you owned it, we would assess it as private ownership. And we would get all those revenue streams. But since it's the federal government, we get 6% in our county off of the mine royalties. Only 6%. So I'm here today to talk on behalf of Iron and Reynolds. The presiding commissioner from Reynolds County could not be here today. So this is something we've been working on. I think we have the language fixed from a technical standpoint now where there's not a conflict. And I would be glad to answer any questions that you might have. This is something that's been going on for over 50 years. The first underground mining I don't think that's related to your testimony. So, okay. jeez. <laughs> Sorry. Go, go ahead. The first mine uh, started in our county in 1961. 
Uh, this state legislation was passed in 1974. That's when the Mark Twain National Forest uh, became the state forest. So this has been going on for over 50 years. Mining is a finite period of time. It's going to disappear once. It's, it will be gone. And it's probably on the tail end of that now as we're seeing the mining leave Iron County and move, all, move forward or south into Reynolds County. So this is something we'd like to get fixed on behalf of the school and the county, which bears all of the financial cost of dealing with the county roads, educational programs, and such. So, uh, um, so you say that the, the 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 mining portion of this, the royalties go, the feds keep seventy five percent of them. Yes, sir. And twenty five percent they return to the state, and then we disperse to all counties that have forestry. Yes, which is actually twenty nine counties okay. right now. And and so you get uh, the, so you get just a small portion of that twenty five percent is what you're saying. And this yes. will change it so you get it however much they pull out of your county. Right. And, and, and the way that we did it, Senator, um, because the veto was because of the way that the that the federal statute is written, that it does have to have some disbursement across all of those forest counties. <laughs> Because that's the way the federal statute is written. Why do they tie forestry to mining? I don't understand. It's, 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 it doesn't make sense. But so the veto, so Romine's bill gave it all to the counties. The veto said that, look, we can't okay, so you completely give some go portion against okay. what the Fed said. So we need to give a portion okay. across all the counties. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you see in here with our split okay. is we're giving a portion to all those counties with forests. But um, but then the line share to okay. the county. So the mines. what's the last year you have numbers on? How much is this twenty five percent? Last year the state received about two million. It's two million dollars. Okay. Uh, questions for this witness? And, uh, just go ahead, Senator. Did you have a question? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next in favor, please come forward. Leave your witness form and give your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Adam Portel. I'm the superintendent of schools in Iron County. Uh, we educate about 350 students in Viburnum, which is in the heart of the mining community. I'm testifying today in favor of this bill. Uh, this bill is going to give my district some financial st stability. Uh, we've had a lot of issues in the last several years. The mining uh, corporation that operates there has protested their taxes for many years and uh, each year they take about 25 percent out of my budget and it's still in litigation so for my students and my parents and my staff uh, this bill will provide that stability and maybe recoup some of those financial uh, issues that we've had and as commissioner skaggs had mentioned uh, you know at some point mining is going to leave my district and my region and uh we're going to have to find a way to uh, continue. So I'm in favor of this bill. I think it's going to be good for my community and my district, and uh, especially good for my students. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for this one? Seeing none. Thanks. Next in favor, please come forward to Senate Bill 481. Chairman, <clears throat> members of the committee, Michael Gibbons representing the Doe Run Company, and just to speak in support. Uh, we thought this situation didn't make any sense. I mean, we're a payer, uh, but the, the fact that, that this has been such a challenge, uh, we've testified in support of this legislation in past years. Uh, I think the senator has figured out how to get past a governor's veto. Uh, and while we, we may have a difference of opinion on s assessment practices in Iron and Reynolds County on occasion, we certainly are in full support of this and think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Questions? For, thank you, Senator. Anybody else in favor? In, anybody in opposition for to Senate Bill 481? Please come forward. Go. Oh. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Arnie C. A. C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate. Uh, I'm for this bill 481. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. 85% um, goes to the affected counties. 
Um, that money remains in those counties to pay back for the damages and capital improvements that are needed. 15% is divided among the other counties throughout Missouri. This bill is similar to House Bill 948, in which I testified in favor, and the bill sponsor said it was approved by the um, uh, Conservation Committee uh, yesterday in the House. Uh, I like the idea of 50% being divided for road improvements, 50% being divided to go to public education, and this bill makes a lot of sense. I ask that you pass this bill and get it onto the governor's desk. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Now, anybody in opposition? I'm sorry. Anybody in opposition? No problem. Nobody in opposition. Anybody for information purposes? Senator Rader, thank you very much for presenting Senate Bill 481. Thank you. We will now do the last bill we have today, my Senate Bill 450. And Senator Rader, if you'll come up here, I'll hand it off to you. I know. I know. <laughs> I could have. Senator, we are ready when you are for Senate Bill 450. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Senators. I'm um, Mike Serpoy with the A Senate District in Jackson County here to present Senate Bill, Senate Committee sub for Senate Bill 450. This bill contains two subjects. The original portion of this bill deals with gas safety. We've heard this bill in committee for several years now. The language aligns Missouri's civil penalties with federal penalty, penalty limits for violations of pipeline safety regulations strengthening Missouri's pipeline safety program. Safety incidents involving natural gas pipelines occur every year in the United States. Some result in serious injuries and death. The ability to impose penalties as an enforcement tool helps to ensure that operators comply with safety requirements. Currently in Missouri, the maximum civil penalties are the lowest in the nation. If adopted, the state would have access to additional funding for monitoring, investigating, and enforcing pipeline safety. The second part, which is the committee sub, uh, modifies the calculation of assessments against public utilities used to fund the Public Service, Service Commission. The PSC is not general funded, general revenue funded, but rather from an assessment against regulated utility ven uh, revenues. This is done as a percentage of their total revenues. The state workforce has, has had back-to-back -back years of cost of living adjustments north of 7% salaries. The PSC personal services, their salaries have increased a total of just over $2 million since January of 2022 as a result of these cost of living adjustments. The associated fringe benefits also increased 1.3 million for a total increase in payroll of approximately $3.3 .3 million. Because the PSC is not general revenue funded, the supplemental budget bill that passed only instructs the PSC to pay its employees more and does not include the funding to do so. After the 8.7% raise, the commission has about a $1.8 million cap space left under the current statutory language. A reduction of, uh, in utilities of 5%, which has happened in the past, would exceed the cap space and the commission would need to ask for a GR supplement. Due to several cost of living raises, the commission is running close to the ceiling cap. If more raises come in the future, it's possible they could exceed the cap. This language increases the cap every two years to accommodate the COLAs and other extraordinary costs. Presently is at point, uh, zero point, I'm sorry, 0 0.315, and this bill takes it to an immediate 0 0.350 and increases it up to a 0.5 over 30 years. The, the impact on average customers would be very small, about $1 a year. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I believe uh, a spokesman for the PSC will be up here shortly. Thank you, Senator. Do we have any questions for the Senator? Seeing none. Anyone wishing to testify in favor, please come forward. Be sure to fill out a witness form. We are ready when you are. Thank you, members of the committee and Senator Searpoy for bringing this bill. I am Doug Anderson. I am the Legislative Director for the Public Service Commission. Um, first, in regards to the gas safety component, um, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Association or something like administration is a sub-department of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, they require that each state have a designated point um, agency to oversee gas safety stuff. And 
the PSC is that organization for the state of Missouri. Um, in total, we get funding from them to administer this program. It's a little over $500,000. Um, they rate our compliance on a series of things to make sure that we're meeting all of the things that we need to as, as the oversight body. Um, because our penalties for um, violations of the um, safety standards are so low, we lose points on our accreditation with them every year. And so that results in a loss of funding to the administration to, to oversee those things. That loss is about $25,000 um, as we get farther and farther because their federal penalties are increasing over time and ours are held um, constant. Um, that gap widens and we lose more points. So um, we've run this bill about 10 years or so. Um, it's one of the things that we have to demonstrate to the federal government is that we are attempting to address these penalties and we get points for doing that. So um, the big portion uh, that I'd like to talk about is actually the, the second portion of, of the bill, the part of, from the committee substitute, and that is um, our assessment. And so uh, if you'll recall, a couple years ago, we did address this for the first time in probably 60 years. Um, that was prior to the massive amount of inflation and the relatively two very large state worker colas. Um, at the time when we had passed uh, the assessment increase two years ago, that had given us a little over a decade's worth of runway and cap space based off of the projections from where we were growing. Um, as a result of the cumulative 2%, and I think it was another 5.5 or something like that last year, and then the 8.7 that the governor uh, put in the supplemental this year, that cap space is now down to, we're going to probably cross that threshold in 2026 um, if there are no changes made. So the one thing that could even accelerate that is the fact that, as Senator Searpoy alluded to, the um, assessment cap is a percentage of utility revenues. So if utility revenues dip, um, the amount of space that we have right now might disappear much more rapidly, um, even possibly next year. So I have information if you guys are interested in terms of how much that fluctuates, but utility revenues are somewhere in the range of a little over 8.7 billion to a low of 7.3 billion over the course of the last decade or so. And so it does ebb and flow, um, and so there are some concerns about how much cap space we have. The PSC, because we're funded through the assessment, um, and we're a little bit different than most other state agencies. The, the problem that we have is that when the supplemental goes through for the COLAs, um, we're essentially told we have to spend more, but we're not given more money because it's not from GR. And so we're just trying to make sure that we can address that. Um, I have a whole bunch of information, but we're running low on time here, I think, so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify in favor? Anyone wishing to testify against? Come on forward. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Larry Ployce again with Spire Missouri Natural Gas. I, I realize that when I come up to testify against this bill, there's two strikes against me. It's the chairman's bill and our chief regulator's bill. But I wanted to point out a few things on the penalty provision. I understand the, the struggle that state government is having as well as everybody's having with labor shortages and, and what's going on within the economy with inflation. Um, but on, on the penalty side of it, I want, to, I want to just share folks with a few things. To my knowledge, there's never been any penalties invoked against any of the natural gas companies. Um, we have a track record of safety for obvious reason, reasons. Our product goes boom. So we have to focus on that. And as I testified earlier, we're at about $200 million a year in safety replacements in the investment across the state. So I think we have an excellent track record. If you look at the current legislation that they're attempting to change years ago, and I'm long enough in the tooth to be around when we changed it last, there was escalators put in that bill to deal with the very issues that they're dealing with. I understand that the federal fines have gone, on, gone up exponentially. I'm not so sure that Missouri always has to keep up with that. And I would point out that I think the previous testimony was this puts it at risk maybe $25,000 of their funding. Um, and our assessment last year by the commission was $4.5 million. 
So I think somewhere in that we can maybe come up with 25000 to offset the federal government's zealous towards increasing those penalties. Uh, but with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for this witness? Senator, go ahead. So basically, this bill is trying to align Missouri with the feds. Correct. Okay. And you're saying, and that's so we can get other money and have other opportunities. But you're saying you want to remain the same at Missouri because it's going to increase the cost on your end, right? Yeah, I, I think any industry that you would represent, I don't know that I would favor somebody wanting to increase penalties. And I would also share Absolutely. this with you in that in Missouri, we are subject to unlimited civil penalties. And it concerns us a little bit in that we work closely with the Missouri Public Service Commission safety staff. And if something occurred and it was a valve or a regulator or a piece of equipment, that if you look at this, it could become a number of violations. So where does it start? Where does it stop? And I think we're all in this thing together. And I think we are already subject to other penalties on a federal level as well, Senator. So I think, I think it's pretty well covered from the hammer that's over top of us to do the right thing. So, so the penalties, so if we're aligning with the feds, would that change Missouri penalties? I haven't read the bill. Well, I think the last calculation I did, it was increase the current penalties that we have in statute tenfold, if not more. And, but would that be, so you're saying that's going to create unlimited civil penalties? The, the civil penalties is a different matter. That would be if a case was taken up in Missouri and somebody filed suit against us on a civil matter. That is an unlimited uh, dollar amount. And, and I could take you to instances like in Kansas City several years ago, unfortunately, when we had a restaurant blow up. That's a whole different set of court, goes through a whole different court system mm -hmm. as opposed to just the penalties that these government agencies could invoke. Okay, very good. So if somebody was hurt, for example, and he hired an attorney, mm -hmm. and he took it to court. That would be the civil procedure. So th there's no limit on that particular case. I don't know if I'm answering your questions. I'd be happy to come sit down and chat with you about no, it. No, it's good. I'm mailing it over. I got it. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify against? Madam Chair, members of the committee, Zach Pollock, registered lobbyist with the Missouri Natural Gas Association, just want to go on record in opposition to the bill. Also turning in witness form for David Hutton on behalf of Liberty Utilities and Summit. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify against? Proceed. Good morning. <clears throat> Tom Robbins from Missouri Energy Development Association. Uh, we're in opposition to this bill. Um, I second uh, Mr. Ployce's comments. He articulated our position well. Uh, but we look forward to working with the sponsor and, um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Next opposed? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate. And I ask that we hold these companies accountable and responsible at the state level, not deviate and give the authority and the enforceability to the federal government. I want to remind you that in the city of O'Fallon, the past two years, the city of Darden Prairie and St. Charles County, there were at least four gas explosions. Num uh, two of the explosions ended in people losing their entire uh, home and all their valuables. Um, this could end up in uh, somebody's life at, at risk here. Uh, this was due to unmarked and mismarked pipelines. Gas safety, gas, gas safety is so important as Missourians' lives are at stake. I'm asking that we don't cut the penalties, that we hold gas companies accountable. I believe in local state control versus the federal government telling Missouri what to do. And I ask that you defeat this bill. Thank you. Do we have any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank, thank you. you. Anyone else wishing to testify against? Anyone for informational purposes only? Thank you. This concludes the hearing on Senate Bill. 
450 and concludes our committee.